know, I was preparing for the service this weekend, and I stole my mic and hid it in the other room. Uh, as you probably are aware now, we are planning a drive-in service this Sunday, which is going to be really exciting. We have a uh, radio transmitter. Oh no, well that was perfect. The mic fell down. <laughs> well, we're in this together. God bless you, saints of the Lord. I just got to fix this real quick. Sorry for all the confusion. There we go. Well, that's the most of our problems. We're doing okay. How do I look? I can watch myself a little down here, so it's, it's a little funny. All right, anyway, we are preparing for this weekend. We're going to be having a, a drive-in service uh, for the first time. We have a radio transmitter that will transmit the sermon and the music directly into your car. You'll be parked in the lot. We've got it all planned out. And all you have to do is sit there and come to church. Stay in your car, sit outside, be socially distanced appropriately so we can all be safe. But at the same time, we'll be together in, in spirit and in body for the first time since all of this began, and I'm really excited about it. All right, uh, in a moment we'll be in Ephesians chapter 4. You can uh, jump ahead if you'd like to, so you're ready in your Bible. Uh, until then, uh, before that at least, I'd like to give you ample opportunity to add any prayer requests or concerns you have to the comment box on this uh, live service so that we might pray together with you. I promise you anything placed there will be uh, responded to, and if there's a prayer request or a prayer need, it will be prayed for and it'll be prayed over, and uh, I just thank you again for joining us for another Living Water Online, and uh, hopefully that's the last time the camera falls over, and hopefully that's the last time I forget my mic. Uh, please join me in a word of prayer as we start this service. Dear Lord my God, I thank you for the love and the hope that we share, Lord, that's found only in your Son, Jesus Christ. I thank you now for Jesus, Lord, the hope that he brings us, the help that he is to us every day, Lord. And God, that you would do so much on behalf of people like us. Lord, it makes me so thankful. It makes me recognize that you are love, and you are loving, and you love us. So, Lord, I pray that we would share that same love with one another, God, that we would be motivated to be lovers as we are loved, to share with each other as there is need, and to help each other as you lead us to live every day. Lord, I pray for everyone listening right now that you would bring them great encouragement, God, that you would bring them great blessing, and that you would help them today to know you a little better than yesterday, God, and that tomorrow we might know you even better than today. Bless and watch over us in your holy and precious name, I pray. Amen. As I said, you can turn to the book of Ephesians. We'll be in the fourth chapter today, a rather famous uh, chapter of Scripture. Uh, I've been dealing now with a, a series on living in victory. And today I thought I'd talk about how we have and can have that victory every day, especially uh, today. And uh, to, for that end, I, I turn to the first ten verses in the book of Ephesians, and I welcome you to, to read those with me. Uh, if you were in church, I'd have said this, God is good. Then you respond all the time. And then I say all the time, God is good. I do that because I always remind, want to remind us that no matter what we're going through in life, God is still behind everything, and he does not change his opinion of us. You know, we might sin now and again, but even if we sin, Christ still died for our sins, and there is still forgiveness and redemption. You're forgiven for what you've done through the grace of God found in Jesus Christ. And there's nothing this side of eternity that can separate us from the love that is found in Jesus Christ. So I welcome you now to think on that great love with me and think of that great heritage we have as we read these Bible verses, starting in verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body 
and one spirit, just as you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He then descended, he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Dear Lord, my God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that your word reveals in us things we otherwise couldn't know. Lord, we hope that today you would open our eyes so that we might not just be hearers, but be doers also. Bless us as we seek you. It's in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Let me start with this today. Common experience is a pretty powerful thing. America, and most of the world, of course, is having it right now. In some ways, it might be fracturing us. Right here is an example. We aren't in church, we aren't going to the gym, we aren't at clubs, clubs are closed, not that I was much of a clubber. Parks seem all but bare. We aren't visiting each other as we have been in the past. And most of our socialization, we're getting on screens. And I bet many of you are hoping right now for a real experience sometime soon. But I want to encourage you, things are looking up. When we originally thought two million people would die or, or could die, it was an astounding thought. Not a good one, but sobering and profound. When they said that 40 to 60 percent of the population would get coronavirus, I know that many were worried. Even when the numbers drastically changed, and now they're saying 100, 000, they were saying 100,000 to 240,000 deaths, we had great cause for concern. And I believe we did the right things with the knowledge we had. Now, praise the Lord, the estimates are lower still, and they may get even lower. And the mortality rate at one time thought to be 3.4% went down to 1% and now to half a percent or less. And they are thinking perhaps coronavirus was here much longer than we ever realized. All of these new facts bring us to a revelation, a realization. I think we have every reason to be optimistic. Our president is working with our governors to reopen states. And honestly, as scary as coronavirus might have been or is, I agree. Because people will eventually get desperate. And we can only borrow from our futures for so long. We can only wait for so long. Originally, they asked for us to stop for two weeks. Well, two weeks ended a long time ago but we're still here. You know, I've heard recently there might be shortages on meat. That's what people are telling me. And I love meat as much as the next guy. But as long as there's no food shortages, I probably won't lose an inch on my belt. Even if worse comes to worse, I, I want us to hold on to this. We are Americans and we are tough. More than that, I still believe that the hand of God is guiding and working behind the scenes and his intentions will not be thwarted by anything. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. This verse does not guarantee that tomorrow things will be better. But it does tell us that God is holding tomorrow. God is holding the future. And his future is better. What if things get tougher? What if things get a little harder? It might worry you, but I think we have every reason to not worry. You see, the cream rises to the top, and I believe Americans are an exceptionally tough and innovative people, the likes of which the world has never seen. Actually, we've gotten so good at it that we excel today in leisure. But that does not mean we've lost what has made us exceptional. I believe we will weather this and we will be strong and I want to give you encouragement to how that might be. We are all Americans, presuming Americans are the only ones listening to this, there might be a few others. And I think that should unite us. 
We can be weak if we get into weakness, if we give into weakness, but we are strong if we hold each other up. There are a lot of forces trying to tear Americans apart. The right and the left with their propaganda, hyperbole, spin, and jargon. Hyper-partisanship and agendas seem to run rampant today. Honestly, it seems to me that to know the truth, you have to juggle the information that is curated to you by these different sources with a grain of salt, skepticism, and wisdom. Realizing that many times they're lying to your face because they care more about themselves than you. And it has become abundantly clear that many people only care about winning an election. I'll never tell anyone who to vote for. I'm just amazed, however, at who has been running and what they believe. And I know how people can make flawed decisions when they're worried. We are all tense, reasonably so. And we might have a plethora of worries right now. While we speak, many have perished. So this makes sense. It should make us sad. It should make us realize the human element in all of this. But don't be quick to give up things that are necessary and essential. While many are dying, many more have died to provide Americans the fundamental, the fundamental and priceless liberties that we exercise today. We should not give those up for any reason. And times like these make more precious the times when we are not under shelter at home orders. This is all the more reason to be ready to go back to living. I'm not saying be reckless, I'm not saying shirk any laws, I'm not saying go out and be in groups together, but don't be so quick to change the everyday normal before this, because something that happens every hundred years happened to happen. You know, we always overact. We always overreact. And then oftentimes we end up having to eat the error. I think of states that banned plastic bags. Did you know it causes way more environmental damage washing the reusable tote bags than having plastic bags? No, they overreacted for brownie points. What we needed to do the whole time was just recycle. Plus, now all these states are reinstating plastic bags because the reusable bags are germ factories and they're dangerous at times like this. This is human foolishness. Nothing done fast is normally done well. Fast is slow, and slow is fast. An engineer friend of mine used to tell me that. If you rush through something, you end up having to go back and redo it, at least most of the time. I've heard people say this lately, that we'll never get back to normal. And I get what they're saying. I'm not saying they're wrong. Obviously, we ought to come out of this wiser. But when all this is said and done, once we've taken a breather and got some vitamin D, then we can talk about repercussions. When we've cleared our heads, we can discuss making the right precautions for the future, not while the whole world seems to be panicking. That is not how good decisions are made. There will be a time for that. I am blessed every day that the number of cases are no longer sloping high, but they are coming down. It would seem we've passed the peak and can now look ahead again to the future. But I ask us now to realize as a nation, we need unity and not division. If one group will not rationally participate in a conversation, that group is altogether and intolerably blind. What is real strength? I worry Christians are blind to what is real strength. You know, I've heard more bad-mouthing of America coming from universities and other establishments in recent years than I did the whole time growing up. And I'm never ashamed, nor will I be ashamed, to be an American. But I am flabbergasted that these people are. And I am amazed people trust these people. You know, when people said if Trump won the election, they were going to move away, actually thought they were going to, and then he did, and they didn't. None of them, as far as I heard, did. Maybe it was never about facts. Maybe people just want to win, and they'll say or do anything to do it. 
But tearing apart the fabric of America is not the right means to any end unless you want us to end in communism. And unity is not communism. <laughs> unity is so important. By that I don't mean the kind of unity some person might think communism is, because that's not true unity, that's oppression. I mean unity in ideals and understanding. Communism pushes people down so they're at the same level, keeps people from excelling. American liberties allow people to lift themselves up. Anyone can be anyone in America. So while the world is spinning around us, we need to hold to that which is worthwhile. If it isn't obvious, one thing that I consider a huge blessing is that I am American. For me, that means I'm part of the freest, most virtuous, and most powerful country that's ever existed. And those things must come hand in hand for any of that to really matter. We have blemishes in the past, in our past, but the ability to correct errors is a blessing in and of itself. But today, we do not live in the shadow of our errors because we strive for something better. Of course, we must be wise. And it's important to be wise, even more so for the Christian. American liberties pose a great challenge to Christians. Because Christianity has always proliferated under pressure. And it seems to me that comfort more than anything has made it easy to ignore the reasons for our calling. This ought not be the case, of course, because it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And the freedoms that we enjoy today are modeled off the understanding set forth in Scripture of the value of the individual in God's eyes. But even the freest and most noble people need Jesus. Of course, I'm speaking in a human scale. But no matter how good you think you might be, you're not good enough. So we must deal with the world, as Christians, with sober judgment. Romans 16, 19 says, Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Christ himself said this in Matthew 10, 16, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves, therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. When Paul wrote our passage, he actually wrote it from prison. He wasn't free like we are, but he still preached with great fervency. And he urged his fellow believers to stand firm in the middle of persecution. He says to live a life worthy of the calling. So I urge you too to stand firm in this current day. To continue to stand firm. Even when the persecution we face is not of the same kind. Even if we can call it that. But more so stand firm in our freedoms. We must stand in the middle of this. How will the world know the truth if the ones who bear the real truth keep it hidden? We are called as bearers of the glory of God in the world, and we must hold this as an essential responsibility, an important responsibility. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, it says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Okay, I think we get this idea. I'm not going to diminish this idea. This is extremely important. We need to live this way. But many of the times we have the same problems people in the world have. We overreact and it ends up hurting us. You know, one of the number one reasons people speak negatively about Christians, one of the ne one number one things they say is that Christians are judgmental. But you know what? That's actually not true. Now, don't get me wrong. Christians can be judgmental. But that's not because Christians are judgmental. It is because people are judgmental. There is no instance where people do not try and make themselves better than others. 
We can't imitate then the people of the world and be like the people of the world and expect to get good results. We need to imitate Christ. And is judgmentalism a thing of Christ? Obviously not. That's why Christianity tells us time and time again to not act like this. Listen to our passage. Verse 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. This verse is in direct opposition to prideful, judgmental behavior. But why isn't that okay? You might say that's a silly question. You might say that sounds as a simple enough question because you probably have an answer to it. It's just not the way Jesus acted. But I still think it's worth asking for us so that we understand each other. How can Christians make a better impact for Christ? That is such an important question for us. So let's deal with it. And I think we'll answer the previous question in the meantime. Looking at our passage, verse 3 says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I want to key in on the word effort. Because I believe Christians ought to be working hard to work together. We ought to be working hard to work together. There is very few things in Christianity that we would call passive. Or I, I think that you'd agree. There are very few callings in Christianity that we would call passive callings. I don't even think this idea of being at peace with people is a passive calling. You know, some people might think of it that way. You go to a monastery, you sit on your hands, and you just leave everyone alone. That seems kind of passive, but it's active in that we're supposed to interact with the world. We're not supposed to hide ourselves. We're not supposed to alienate ourselves. We're not supposed to be completely separated from those that need Christ. We're not supposed to join in in sin. But how do we have opportunity to speak the words we know that are true if we don't interact with the sinner? The first century believers would always go to the synagogue and preach to the Jewish unbelievers Jesus Christ. They specifically went to the place where the non-believers were and spoke to them so that they could believe. What didn't they do? They didn't cause trouble on purpose. You know, I see a bit of this today. People think there's power in causing trouble. People think there's, there's power in, in breaking laws and, and shouting the loudest. I think a lot of times it makes people look pretty bad. Honestly, I, I don't know if that's really the way. They think that's the way. But then Martin Luther King Jr., he, he had civil disobedience. They might have broke some laws, so to speak. But they, they didn't do what these people do. We have a responsibility as Christians to live at peace with all men. We represent Christ, right? Now, would Christ make enemies? That's a very good question. Because Christ did make people mad at times. Christ did upturn tables. He said, my house was meant to be a house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves. Christ even had the religious leaders of his day so against him that they literally killed him. But in that same vein, Christ would have accepted anyone who came to him honestly in faith. Through him, anyone is accepted. He didn't just arbitrarily turn people away. He didn't just choose to be against people because of some characteristic of their being. He didn't just choose to be against people because of even their sin. If he had chosen that, we would all be pretty well done. Christ didn't go out making enemies. Even Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were part of the Sanhedrin. They were, by all accounts, believers. That's what Paul says to us in Romans. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So we don't make enemies because an enemy is probably someone who will not listen to us when we get a chance to tell them about Jesus. That doesn't mean everyone's going to like us. But we need to be working to be at peace with people. 
especially other Christians. Ooh, that's where it came in. That's what I was getting at. Ooh, that's, that's where our passage jumps in. You know, for the unbeliever, Christ is an offense. We don't need to add to the offense. I don't think Christians need to cause problems with, with non-believers. But this verse here is even more specific. Do not harbor ill will more so for the believer than even the unbeliever. Don't hold ill will for any of them. But Christians need to lift each other up. We're called to work with other Christians for the greater good. That is for the renown of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we often get in the way of that calling. Can you imagine being a manager in a business where all your workers were squabbling with each other? If Christ wasn't so forgiving, boy, would we be in trouble, wouldn't we? We need to stop worrying so much about others and worry about ourselves in the work of God. Worry about how people are doing, but not judging what they are doing. We need to work hard to work together, make that a part of our calling, and then make sure that we do our part of the work, do your part of the work. The passage says there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Can I get a hallelujah? Amen. Who is over all and through all and in all. Christians share Christ. I mean that in both ways, actually, because you can read that both ways. We share Christ together, and we're called to share Christ in the world. And the point of it all being here, the point of being here is, is our calling to share Christ. Even while we share Christ together. And is Christ divine? Is Christ against himself? Doesn't that sound like a Bible verse? Of course it does. It is. 1 Corinthians 1.13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? The answer is no. Christ is not divided against himself. So why must we divide ourselves so? We ought not be divided. We need to work together. I'm not saying I agree with everything every other Christian does. But I'm not their Lord. I'm not saying there aren't certain tenets of our belief that are ultimately so important I'm not sure I could work with some people. Actually, I consider doctrines very important. But I consider the cause of Christ so important that scrutinizing things too thoroughly might be detrimental to the greater cause of Christ. We need to make it a priority to work together. And this passage is not just implying a responsibility to care about that. It's, this is an interesting thought. We ought not just work together. We need to make it a priority to work together. Listen to John 17, 23. It was actually up uh, just a minute ago. I am them, this is Christ speaking, and you in me, so that you may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So when Christians live in unity, the world will know that he, God, sent Jesus and that God loves us. That's amazingly profound. That's the power of working together. And we need to do our part in the work together. And that works by seeing your place in the greater picture. Our passage paints a beautiful picture of the faith that we share. One spirit, one body, one calling, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of it all. We need to start seeing ourselves in the finished work of God to see your place in the greater picture and realize that God has apportioned us grace to accomplish the task for which he's called us. 
We do share Christ together. We must also share Christ in the world. We share Christ in that he's given us grace. He's apportioned us a certain amount of his grace. He gives and he can take away. And you know, while we stand here, no, I, I think all of us are willing to admit none of us are worthy of him. But there are blessings in being obedient to him. He wants to give us opportunity. But are we the people who deserve those opportunities? We're not going to be worthy of Christ. But if we're not in a place to receive an apportioned grace, a great blessing, we might just miss it. Can he give us those opportunities? Are we who we need to be or ought to be? Are we where we're supposed to be? And you could ask, does that even matter? Is God diminished when we're stuck at home? No, no, the answer is no. The answer is absolutely no. We can have church in our living rooms, sitting at our PJs, holding a cat or a dog or something else, or sitting together on the couch watching a Facebook video. That's perfectly fine. God is not diminished. But at the same time, the structures which God put in place are meant to help us, develop us, and grow us in the work. We need to take every opportunity. We need to accept every blessing. We need to hoard those blessings, not just for ourselves, but so that we can use the benefits of those blessings in the world for his purposes. Are we worried that we're missing opportunities? Today? Or are we just being short-sighted? You know, a lot of uh, places are using Zoom and, and teleconferencing and things like that. Don't think for a second God, God's work can't happen. Teleconferencing. Our God is the God who sits on the throne. Christ ascended on high. That's what our passage even says. There's nothing that is coming down the pike that will chip away his authority. And all of us need to recognize his authority in our lives today. How much authority then does Christ have? All authority. It's part of the Great Commission for a reason. Let's listen to this in, in Matthew. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The great commission begins with a great truth, and it ends with a great truth. Both support the mission he's called us into. Both should encourage us in the mission we have in Christ. First, his authority is ultimate. And second, he's not abandoning us. He's with us always to the very end. We are all a part of Christ. His authority is whole. His support is complete. And we can accomplish what he's asking us to do if we trust him and work together. <clears throat> you know... I said at the beginning, I'm proud to be an American. Part of that is the belief that American, America stands for certain things. Being a Christian also stands for certain things. I think Americans should be there for each other. I think we ought to be giving groceries for our neighbors who are elderly, especially right now. We ought to be watching for, over our loved ones, especially those in the church. And being a Christian stands for certain things. Maybe different things than the American things, but not completely. Thankfully, 
Many of the Christian things we believe are not in opposition to our American heritage. That is such a huge blessing. That means, unlike Paul, we're not going to find ourselves thrown in jail. That means, unlike many Christians around the globe, we're not losing our homes, our lives, on our families, to persecution and tribulation. And that is such a huge blessing. But in spite of this, it seems to me it's very easy for us to complacently go about our day without thinking of Christ, without thinking of each other. You know, what is best about America reflects what Christ has taught us. So we are free to practice freely, and we ought to be free because Christianity is what has built the structure of America. But at the same time, we must be willing to carry the mantle more firmly because Christ is what the world needs today more than ever. We need the power of Christ to guide us through this, and not just this, but all things like this. People need Jesus. For my Christians, I have a word of encouragement. The word of encouragement is simple enough. You have a great calling in your life. The Lord wants to use you for his ultimate and eternal purposes. That begins with active considerations of your calling. How, how do you live a life worthy of the calling that you've received? Well, you have to begin with your calling, and it's great. Jesus is our calling. Spreading his name is our goal. And we're not going to accomplish anything in a passive state of existence. That's why service is called service and not just sitting around. We're called to serve Christ. We share Christ, and we share Christ. That's your calling, Christian. To work with like-minded Christians. To see his work get done. But maybe you're watching today and you're not a Christian. You know, I don't know how appealing much of this message has been to you because most of it has been for Christians. And you know what? It might not seem so appealing when a pastor has to get on and, and try to teach us things. Try to teach Christian things in front of you and, and you wonder what this community really means. You know what, I don't want you to worry too much about that though. Something about being a Christian is we're always trying to get closer to the heart of Christ. That calls us to discipline. It calls us to reading our Bibles. It calls us, well, to be wise in the world. If you're not a Christian though, you're not ready for that. You need to start with Jesus Christ. He came to this earth and he died for you. He gave up his life for you. As many people have died for your freedoms that you have as an American, Jesus died for ultimate freedom so that you could be free to live a holy life for God. You're a sinner like me. But Jesus covers those sinful stains with his sacrifice and blood. And anyone who comes to God in the name of Jesus Christ will be saved. If you're listening and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to tell you, Jesus will accept you. But you must go to him. You must ask him for your forgiveness. And he'll forgive you. If you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and you want to do that, I want to give you an opportunity right now. Just pray along with me. Dear Lord, my God, I pray that you would help me. That you would forgive me of my sins. That you would teach me more about Jesus. 
that you'd give me your free gift of salvation. And Lord, you'd help me to take my next steps in faith. Bless and watch over me. It's in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. For those of us who are already saved, I'm going to pray for us too. So please join me in a word of prayer as we close our time together. Dear Lord, my God, I thank you for your grace that has been given to us, Lord, that has been apportioned to each of us that we might serve you. Lord, I pray that we would all take that calling very seriously. Lord, even when we're separated, even when we're in our own homes, Lord, listening to things like this, it doesn't change the power of God in our lives. It doesn't change your calling in our lives, Lord. And maybe we just need to get a little more innovative. But no matter, you can enable us to fulfill the work you've called us to. So, Lord, I pray for all the Christians listening. I pray that your mighty right hand would cover them. I pray that you would lead them in knowledge and in wisdom. And, Lord, you would help us together to grow the kingdom. And it's your, in your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. I, I hope it was a blessing for you. I hope you enjoyed um, your time here. Uh, please mark any comments or anything down in the comment section if you have any, any requests or any, any prayer needs. And I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. I'm really excited for Sunday. We're starting our drive-in service, as I said, for the first time. Uh, this radio transmitter, I've been testing it. I drove all over the parking lot listening to it. I, I took all the vantage. I drove to all these different spots and took vantage points about where I was going to preach from uh, so that most of you could, so most everyone can hopefully see me. Um, not that it's about me, but it's just about being together. And I'm really excited for it. So I hope I see you on Sunday. If I can't see you in person, please join us again for Living Water Online. This will still be sent out, and uh, I'm sure the Lord is, uh, will bless it. Uh, Lord, Lord be with you. I love you. God bless you.